So let's begin with the issues that the courts decided to settle. Uh, so here they are. There's a joint memorandum of issues filed by the parties and adopted by this court for the determination as follows. So when people go to court, uh, you, you take me to court or I take you to court, we agree on the issues to settle. What are the issues to settle? Is this land for me? Is the land for you? Whether or not I bought the land before? We agree. So the issues I'm going to read was agreed by both parties. That these are the questions that the Supreme Court will answer. It is called the, the memorandum of issues. It's always part of every case. So when the court begins to deal with the issues, they know that both parties have agreed that these are the issues to be dealt with. Number one, whether or not upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 102 and 104 of the Constitution, a Deputy Speaker of Parliament or any other member of Parliament presiding over Parliament in the absence of the speaker, cannot be counted as part of the members present before a decision is taken, whether or not it cannot be counted. Uh, issue number two, whether or not upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 102 and 104 of the Constitution, a deputy speaker or any other member of parliament presiding over parliament in the absence of the speaker can vote or take part in the making of a decision by parliament. Issue number three, whether or not the decision taken on the 30th of November 2021 by the Parliament of Ghana to approve the 2022 budget was a nullity as 138 members, excluding the person presiding, were not present in the parliament before the decision was made. Okay, so those, when we now know the issues that are being discussed, whether the speaker can be counted, whether the deputy speaker can be counted, whether he can vote, and whether or not, to that extent, the decision taken about the budget on 22nd November was valid or not. Okay, here are the preliminary issues that the courts looked at. One, the third issue is different. It implies particular proceedings in the House and turns at least in part on issues of fact or parliamentary procedure that could be in a dispute. The disputation of the facts would have been a matter of concern and a reason for caution in considering the propriety of the seizure of our jurisdiction in relation to this issue. However, the parties are agreed on the antecedents. Indeed, we must take judicial notice of the fact that the decision taken on 30th November 2021 by the Parliament of Ghana to approve the 2022 budget <coughs> sought to reverse <coughs> and undo a previous decision of the House disapproving the same budget. Indeed, we must take judicial notice of the fact that the decision on the 30th of November 2021 by the Parliament of Ghana to approve the 2022 budget sought to reverse and undo a previous decision of the House disapproving the same. Let's move on. The first vote had been taken at a sitting of the House with 137 members, and then the second vote 138. The different decisions of the House on the different dates of citizens or citizens arose from the fact that the speaker and the first deputy speaker had reached different interpretations of the applicable quorum provisions of the house so the justice kulendi who is writing is telling us that something that he wants to take notice of is that the matter before the supreme court has other dimensions one of the dimensions is that the same house of parliament has disapproved the budget and did not approve the budget if you like the same House of Parliament then approved the budget. There were those who approved the budget, 137, because MPP worked out. Those, those who disapproved the budget, 137, MPP worked out. Those who approved the budget, 138, NDC worked out. Now, Kulendi says, this is a, Kulendi JSC, I should say, says that this is arising out of the fact that the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker had different understandings of what a quorum of Parliament is about. So he's telling us, before in his ruling, calling it preliminary issues, that these are the issues that have animated the conversation, and so he's going to deal with it. Okay, excellent, excellent uh, setting of the stage. If the disparate interpretations preferred by the parties exclusively implicated the standing orders, procedures, and practice of Parliament, without more, we would have had no difficulty in reaching the conclusion that Parliament is and ought always to be master of his own procedure. Orders and practices without let or hindrance from the court. In such a case, these would have been matters that lie peculiarly within the domain of Parliament and would, therefore, not be matters appropriate for judicial determination. Justice Kulendi has given us a very important distinction. He says that the matters that are before the court, assuming that they were matters that concern only Parliament's procedure without more, just the parliament procedure, then those matters will not have been available for a judicial decision if it just concerns parliament's procedure. But he's saying something beyond that. Let's see what he says. He says, however, to the extent that the challenge to these proceedings in the third issue are equally anchored on rival interpretations to the combined reading of Articles 102 and 104 of the Constitution 
The only court mandated under Article 130 to interpret the true and proper meaning of these provisions of the Constitution is this court, referring to the Supreme Court. Consequently, this court will be failing in its constitutional responsibility and mandate if we were to avoid or fail to provide clarity and direction and take cover under a so-called political question doctrine. I like the way Justice Kulendi comes up with the political question very early in his, in his ruling. There's something they call, and Speaker Bagbin relies on that, the political doctrine that it's a political doctrine, so Supreme Court shouldn't comment on it. It's Parliament's own procedures. It's, just, it's the way Parliament does its things. This is a political doctrine that will favor one political party or the other, leave Parliament. That's a, you can interpret it differently, but that's the so-called political doctrine. I'll look for the book on it and show it to you. That's the political doctrine. It's, it's an old, you know, since Montesquieu uh, pro propounded separation of powers in his book entitled Spirile Loire in 1738 or so, they talked about political doctrine. Okay, so Justice Kulendi is telling us that. The matters that are being discussed, it's not just about Parliament's procedure. It extends to the interpretation of Articles 102 and 104, the combined effect of it thereof. And to that extent, the meaning of Article 102 and 104 can only be determined by the court. And that the court will determine it anyway, even if that determination of the matters are discussed or described as a political doctrine. That's what Aiken said. That's what Aqua said. That's what Kulendi JSC is saying. It's not new. And that's why I agree with the president. He says that he doesn't even understand where all this is coming from. Students of constitutional law should, be to, should have a straightforward answer to this matter. But anyway, let's move on. Which is to say, as Justice Kulendi says, that it is a function of the principles of separation of powers that certain questions presented for resolution by the courts that are expressly or impliedly constitutionally committed to the elected political branches of government for resolution be left to those branches because such questions may be said to be non-justiciable and consequently the judiciary ought to abstain from deciding them as doing so would cause judges to intrude upon the functions of the elected branches of government. So for instance, the president makes an appointment, a political question, makes an appointment of somebody as a minister, deputy minister or something like that. Supreme Court's cannot come in to say certain things. They can only come in if the constitutional requirement of that appointee has been violated. If somebody goes to them and says, Mr. Adumotri has been nominated for Minister X, but to be Minister X, he should have been 50 years old under the constitution. Mr. Adumotri is not 50 years old. The president has nominated him and parliament has proceeded to vet him and he is going to be sworn in as Minister this. The Supreme Court can, so long as you have raised the matter of constitution, the Supreme Court can come in. If you don't raise a matter of constitution and you are saying something else, the Supreme Court cannot come in. That's, the, that's what he's saying. When elected arms of government, presidencies, parliament, they are elected and they are doing their thing, so long as they have not violated or there's no allegation that they violated the law, the Supreme Court cannot come in. That's the, the conversation about the political doctrine. And let's see how he ends up. He says, having regard to the issues joined in this case, such an avoidance would have been legitimate. In fact, compelling if the issues at hand rested entirely and in all respects on parliamentary procedure, orders and practices without more. It must be noted that the 1992 Constitution establishes constitutional supremacy as against parliamentary supremacy. And that parliamentary supremacy as pertains in the United Kingdom, Parliament is sovereign and all laws, decisions, procedures of Parliament are final and cannot be subject to judicial review. That's very interesting because that comes from the First Republic. And those of us who are students of constitutional law remember the famous anecdote of J.B. Dankwa in Ri Akoto when he asked the court, presided over the Sasayako Kosa, he asked the court that how can the creature be superior to the creator? Dr. Dr. Dankwa labored to make the argument before the Supreme Court that the Constitution is supreme to Parliament. The Attorney General of the day, a British-Irish man, Jeffrey Bain, said that no, Parliament is superior to the Constitution. Dr. Dankwa said, no, we don't have supremacy of parliament like you have in your country. This is Ghana. We have a constitution. And they said, no, the Supreme Court took the view that there's no provision in the constitution that makes the constitution superior. And therefore, subsequent constitutions, 69, 79, 92, have all clearly stated without ambiguity that the constitution is the fundamental law of the land and any law found to be inconsistent with the constitution shall to the extent of the inconsistency be null and void. This is coming from the case of Akoto in the 1960s, where Dr. Dankwa labored to say that parliament is a creator of the constitution. How can the creator be superior to the creator? 
The Supreme Court panel led by Saku Kosa said, we agree with you, but there's nothing in the Constitution that says the Constitution is supreme. Therefore, we will assume parliamentary sovereignty, which is still what England does. Parliament is sovereign in England. In England, they didn't even have a Supreme Court until recently. They had what they call the highest court of the land in England was part of Parliament. That's how supreme and sovereign their Parliament is. The highest court of the land was the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords. That was their Supreme Court. Now they have a Supreme Court. But that Supreme Court does not have power to interpret anything Parliament does. So that's what Justice Kulendi is presenting uh, to us. That, that's, that's England. Okay, let's move on. The courts may merely apply the legislation. This is still about Britain. Okay, so let's hurriedly move on. In exercising its interpretative and enforcement mandate, the court has power to adjudicate all and any allegations that any acts, omissions, and enactments are inconsistent with or in contravention of the Constitution without the exception, exceptions tended to be suggested on grounds of the doctrine of political question. This court has predominantly on a preponderance of authorities, long held the view that the political question doctrine does not apply within our jurisdiction. Thank you, Justice Kulendi. And are they, are they reading it at all? Are they reading it? They, they have been accused not to read. Are they reading the judgment? He says that there is a preponderance. Where is it? Omission, enactment, constitution without exception. Okay, this court, the final paragraph, has predominantly... And on a preponderance of force, that means plenty times we have said it. Many, many times this court has said they haven't heard it because they haven't read it. Many, Justice Kulendi is, 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 is frustrated. He said, ah, but this matter of so-called political doctrine that we shouldn't talk about it. This court has predominantly and on a preponderance of authorities long held the view... I can you imagine how you are frustrating the Supreme Court judge? He says, ah, but this matter, we have long held the view there's a preponderance of authority. It is a predominant view of the court that there's nothing called political question so long as a constitutional interpretation is raised. That's what, that's what the learned Supreme Court judge is laboring to tell us. I hope that this time people read it. Okay. In the case of the MPP, so he's going on to list all those, he's going on to justify what he's saying, predominant, preponderance, long held. So he's listing it out there, MPP versus Attorney General, that's the 31st Zimba case, I just talked to you about the 31st Zimba case, uh, in, this, in this court held, uh, in any case by Articles 1 and 2 of the Constitution 1992, the doctrine cannot have any political application to us here in Ghana. He's referring to what they said in the case, because that was a major matter of political doctrine. The elected authority, Fly Lieutenant Rawlings, delivers 57% of the election. He's a politically elected officer with the supreme majority of the Ghanaian people, believing that he should be president, and nominated him. He comes and says that 31st December is what made me. I, I began to lead this country on 31st December 1981, and I think I've done a great job, and myself and my cadres need to celebrate as a holiday. It's a political decision taken by Rawlings. And the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot. And the Supreme Court was aware that there would be complaints and concerns that this was a political doctrine. Indeed, the Attorney General of the day made the argument before the court that a court cannot have jurisdiction over this matter because it's a political question. Or if you like a political doctrine, the Supreme Court said no. So long as constitutional interpretations have been raised, we will speak on it. And by a 5-4 majority, they ruled that 31st Zimba cannot be a holiday. And that's why Justice Kulendi is saying since 1992, we are in 2022. They don't know this. The court has, that's why he said, long held, predominant, preponderance. He's, 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 he's frustrated. Because this is since 1992. And that's why the other day I gave you the list of the NDC lawyers. Let's go and ask them. Tony Lita, Marietta Brew, Oye Lita, Chachu Chikata. What is their view on the matter? Because they know or they ought to know that the court has long held this view. And then when the Supreme Court finally pronounces on something that they've held already, that's why you saw a 7-0 majority, a unanimous decision. Then I said, Rinke Chia says, go and slap him. Okay, let's, let's move on. What more is Kulendi saying? The conclusion is inescapable that in this country we have, that's the last paragraph, the conclusion is inescapable that in this country, we have no doctrine of political question such as exists in the United States. Yes, the originality of our constitution, aspects of the originality of our constitution, 
is what Justice Kulendi talks about in the last paragraph that I put on the screen. He said, the conclusion is inescapable that you cannot look at this matter and have any other conclusion. That's what Justice Kulendi is saying. You cannot look at this matter and have any other conclusion. Therefore, the conclusion is inescapable that in this Ghana, by this constitution, we have no doctrine of a political question such as exists in the United States of America. Even in the United States, the Supreme Court determined who should be president. In the year 2000, they made the determination about Florida, and that took the presidency to the Republican Party. Well, <laughs> okay. Quote, he says, he's quoting something. Subject to the provisions of this constitution, Parliament may, by standing orders, regulate its own procedure. He quotes, he says, emphasis is his. Consequently, the Lord Justice says, Parliamentary standing orders are subservient to the Constitution. And in any case, no arm of government or agency of the state, including Parliament, is a law unto itself because, without exception, everyone and everything in Ghana is subject to the Constitution. Fantastic writing by Justice Kolendi. What else do you want? I mean, we should be proud as Ghanaians that we have justice of the Supreme Court who can write these things that can, is comparable to any judge anywhere in the world, comparable to the American Supreme Court, comparable to the Canadian Supreme Court, comparable to the Bangladesh Supreme Court. This is coming from Ghana, one of your own, giving such an erudite judgment, using words that give you the meaning. And some people don't like it because the ruling was not in their favor. I don't like that. Okay. As a result, an allegation that parliament has acted and or is acting in a manner that is inconsistent with, in contravention of, and ultra vias to the constitution will render parliament, the actions, orders, rules, or procedures in issue amenable to the jurisdiction of this court. As such, any provision in the orders, rules, procedure, practice of parliament that contradicts are, contradict, are inconsistent with or purports to confer on Parliament powers not vested by the Constitution will sin against Articles 1, 2, 2, 1 of the Constitution, which read as follows. Must we read it? Okay. One, this Constitution shall be the supreme law of Ghana, and any other law found, it is in Article 1. The first article that they put down, not the Constitution, first thing they put down, after they talked about sovereignty, the next thing they say, so sovereignty relies, one, one is sovereignty is in the hands of the people of Ghana. Then one, two, they come straight. One, first, article. so if you don't want two, nine, eight articles, you don't want to read all. Okay, I'm lazy, so I don't like reading. So I understand that. I'm trying to work on it. But if you are lazy like me, and you don't want to read 298 articles, so the first one, two, you didn't see it. I mean, how? Yeah, you are lazy. I'm lazy. I, I'm, I agree. I'm working at it. You are, I'm lazy. I don't want to read 298. I said, when I was in law school, they said, I tell the 298 is too plenty for me. I don't, I'm lazy. I, I want to read small pen and I move away. But the small pen, it must include article one. Unless you don't want to open the book at all, which we have heard that some people don't read at all. You, you don't want to open, because if you open it, it's staring at you. It's at article one. You don't need to get to 18, 1900. I don't get there. I'm lazy. I don't want to get there. But just the one, first one, you didn't see it. One, two. Clause 2 of 1. This constitution shall be the supreme law of Ghana. And any other law found to be inconsistent with any provision of this constitution shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. You, you don't, this is it's straightforward. You don't understand it or what? Any person who alleges that an enactment or anything contained in the constitution, okay, the person should go to the supreme court. Oh, let me hurry up. Let me hurry up so we can hear some uh, law from Sir Dennis. It is worthy of note that the words subject to the provisions of this constitution, which preface Article 93, are deliberately intended by the framers of the constitution to subordinate, subject, and or limit parliament's primary law-making function to the tenets of the constitution. Therefore, neither parliament as an institution nor its members, officers, orders, practices, conventions, or procedures can be said to be independent of and an exempt from the limitations imposed by the Constitution. Fantastic. And it's fantastic for NDC. It's fantastic for MPP. It's fantastic for Ghana that we have this kind of Constitution that we can be proud of. I talk about amendments of certain parts of the Constitution, yes. And, but I don't support a wholesale, you know, removing the Constitution. These are aspects of the Constitution that you can tell that the people who put the 1992 Constitution together were thinking, our forebears were thinking, 
They were doing original thinking when they put these things in the Constitution to distinguish us from Britain, distinguish us from the United States. I mean, on occasions like this, you have to mention names like Kwame Nahoy and say that these are people who had great brains. Kwame Nahoy was an essential part of drafting this Constitution. You have to talk about them. Nana Ne, Fiko Koto, and others who were in the Consultative Assembly. The, the memorandum from the Ghana Bar Association. All of that is what brought this thing together. That is it. That's the constitution we have. And some people say no. Well, an alleged infringement of any provision of the constitution by parliament will render parliament amenable to the jurisdiction of this court, as in the instance case whereby the plaintiff contends that parliament has acted in breach of Article 102 and 104 of the constitution. The issues agreed for trial are therefore clear-cut constitutional questions that invite the courts to interpret Articles 102 and 104 of the 1992 Constitution, respectively, and we shall now proceed to address same. Hallelujah be to the resurrected Lord. I think the ruling is beautiful. Even if this ruling is not in my favor, I should look at it and say, this is scholarly work. This is a Supreme Court that has done scholarly work. This is a Justice Kulendi who has sat down to do a scholarly work. And it's comparable to anything anywhere in the world. If you take this ruling to the American Supreme Court, to the British House of Laws, they will clap. But this is a ruling. Fantastic ruling. And then some people say, okay, they say I shouldn't say that. But some people say they should go and slap the speaker. Some people say they should come to parliament and let's enforce it. Let's see. Those people should bow their heads in shame. Okay. In so doing, we are mindful of the fact that the 1992 Constitution is a document sui generis and should be interpreted according to the rules peculiar to its character and not necessarily according to ordinary rules or statutory interpretation. When Justice uh, uh, Sir Dennis joins us, he'll tell us what sui generis is. And so note that down. He'll tell us what it is. Okay. Uh, so uh, I see in 2-4 versus Attorney General. So what JSC, I think, he wants to write, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, in 2-4 and Attorney General uh, admonish as follows. He's going to quote Justice Sowa. Let's see whether it's relevant for our conversation. The Constitution has his letter of the law. Equally, the Constitution has a spirit. It is the fountainhead. Okay, we don't need this. Uh, the living organism of the Constitution is what they are talking about. Okay, the, Justice Kulendi goes on. The learning from the plethora of case law is that discharging our obligation under Article 130 of the Constitution, we must construe the Constitution as a whole, adopting a broad liberal approach instead of a straight-jacketed mechanical approach that does not take into account and give effect to the collective aspirations of the Ghanaian people as solemnly expressed in the preamble of the Constitution to secure for ourselves and posterity the blessings of liberty, equality, and opportunity, and prosperity, and affirming our commitment among others, to freedom, justice, probity, and accountability, the principle that all powers of government spring from the sovereign will of the people and the rule of law. Okay, that's interesting. That's a quotation from the Constitution. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so now Kulendi answers the question. Whether or not, upon a true and proper interpretation of Articles 102 and 104 of the Constitution, a Deputy Speaker of Parliament or any other member of Parliament presiding over Parliament in the absence of the Speaker cannot be counted as part of the members of parliament. Now, this is answer. The first issue presented for judicial determination concerns quorum. There are two separate quorum provisions that govern the business of the House. The general quorum provision is found in Article 102 of the Constitution. It reads as follows. A quorum in parliament, apart from the person presiding, shall be one-third of all members of parliament. It's very interesting. 102 says a quorum in parliament, apart from the person presiding, shall be one-third of all members of parliament. It means that this one does not count the person presiding. Let's move on. In other words, the, the Lord Justice, Justice is saying, for the words to commence, for the house to commence and proceed with the ordinary business of the day, there must be in attendance at least one-third of all members of parliament apart from the person presiding. Okay, let's move on. There is a second quorum provision found in Article 104.1. This provision applies specifically and exclusively to voting to determine a matter in Parliament. Article 1041 provides as follows, quote, Except as otherwise provided in this Constitution, matters in Parliament shall be determined by the votes of the majority of members of present and voting with at least half of all the members of Parliament present. His emphasis added. 1041 again provides that, except as otherwise provided in this Constitution, matters in Parliament shall be determined by the votes of the majority of members present and voting with at least one half of the members present. Okay. The rationale for having two separate current provisions is simple. The business of Parliament is diverse. 
Parliament is, first and foremost, a deliberative chamber where members meet to debate and discuss various matters of public moment. The rationale for having two separate current provisions is simple. Oh, this is a repetition of the first one. The business of Parliament, okay. However, where Parliament must exercise its legislative power, that's the last paragraph of what's on your screen. However, where Parliament must exercise its legislative power to decide or determine a matter before it, the Constitution sets a higher quorum threshold requiring in that instance at least half of the members present or Parliament of Parliament to be present before a vote can be taken. Okay, let me summarize it so we can get it clear. All right. So it says that, uh, according to the, doc the document, Justice Kulendi is isolating from the Constitution two quorum. The quorum for doing business and the quorum for voting. Parliament does many things. Parliament takes announcements. They debate on certain things. If today is uh, the Independence Day of Nigeria, the 1st of October, a statement may be put down in the name of uh, uh, our Honorable Alexander Fenyo Marking, Member of Parliament for Winneba Ifutu. And uh, he may say, Mr. Speaker, uh, today I'd like to say a very happy birthday to the Republic of Nigeria, our brothers. That's a statement on Nigeria's Independence Day. They can be a statement on uh, an, an Ukraine-Russia war. All of, all of those things are the part of the deliberative work of Parliament. As soon as Parliament is to take a decision on the vote, the quorum is different. The Supreme Court says when you want to vote, that's different. When you are not voting, you are deliberating just so that you can do business. One third of the members is okay without the person presiding, just one third. However, when you want to vote, you must have half of all the members of parliament present. Who are all the members of parliament? Does it include the deputy speaker? Is he a member of parliament? Is that not the only question in Article 104? Members of parliament voting, present, and voting, half of them. Anyway, let's move on. Let's see what the, the, the Supreme Court said. In effect, he says, the framers of the Constitution place voting in Parliament on a higher order of importance or magnitude than debating. Thus, while Parliament can commence business and proceed to debate a matter as long as one, as long as one third of its members are in attendance, it, Parliament, cannot proceed to take a decision on the matter by vote unless and until at least one half of the members are present. The higher quorum threshold for voting, set at a minimum of half the members of parliament, is, designate, is designed to ensure that decisions of the House, which carry legal or legislative consequences, are not taken unless at least half of the membership of parliament is in attendance. It is designed, in effect, to prevent a minority of members of parliament from proceeding to decide a matter with binding legal effect. The more specific question presented by plaintiff's issue Issue one is whether the deputy speaker, when presiding in the absence of the speaker, is to be counted for the purpose of determining the voting quorum, which is set at one half of all the members of parliament. This question appears to stem from the fact that, pursuant to Article 102, the general quorum of parliament is determined without counting the person presiding. But, as previously explained, this general quorum provision is not the provision that governs the quorum for the purpose of voting in parliament that is dealt with under Article 1041, which sets the voting quorum at one half of the membership of parliament. Thus, read together with Article 1041, the quorum contemplated in Article 102 should be properly understood to mean the quorum for all other business of parliament other than voting. C'est bon? Oui, c'est bon. Yeah, c'est bon. Oui, 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 c'est bon. Simple, self-explanatory. The quorum in 102 is a quorum for doing business. The one in 104 is a quorum for voting. That's what the Constitution clearly says. Okay. As to that non-voting quorum, Article 102 makes it clear that a presiding deputy speaker who is a member of parliament and president shall not be counted in determining the number. However, when it comes to the determining the voting quorum under Article 104, no such restriction or limitation is placed on a presiding member or deputy speaker. The clear implication consistent with the expression, uh, um, it's a Latin word, Sir Dennis will explain, is that being one of the members present, a presiding deputy speaker is entitled to be counted in determining the quorum that is required for the House to proceed to vote on a matter. Okay. The non-inclusion of the phrase, apart from the person presiding, in Article 1041 must, be, must have been deliberate to hold otherwise would amount to impugning the wisdom of the framers of the Constitution and supplanting their clear intention. 
the exclusion of a presiding deputy speaker from the non-voting quorum on the one hand, and his or her inclusion in the voting quorum on the other hand, again underscores the fact that the different functions of parliament are not regarded as being on the same order of importance or magnitude. From here, I'll just go straight to the ruling. Okay, so, so yes, you get it. Very simple and straightforward. He says that 102 and 104 shows that the constitutional framers were thinking about different levels of responsibility for parliament, different levels of importance, discussing Nigeria's Independence Day, discussing Russia-Ukraine war without any voting consequence is different from when you are voting on e levy, when you are voting on budget, when you are voting on public holidays, when parliament is to make a decision. The decisions of parliament are captured after voting processes. The decisions of parliament are not captured after deliberations. As I said the other day, as for the debate, it happens on Good Morning Ghana, it happens on Joy FM, City, it happens everywhere. But the voting happens only in the chamber of parliament. Okay, at this stage, let me go straight to the, the ruling of the court. And um, uh, let's see, it says, in view of the foregoing, we answer the plaintiff in the negative and declare that a presiding deputy speaker is entitled to be counted for the purpose of forming quorum under 104. The 1992 constitution makes the provision for uh, speaker, two deputy speakers in two distinct provisions, the relevant parts of which are reduced as follows. Okay, so he goes to talk about the speaker. There shall be a speaker of parliament who shall be elected by members of parliament from among members of parliament who are members of, from among persons who are members of parliament or who are qualified to be elected as members of parliament. Deputy Speaker, there shall be two deputy speakers of parliament, A, who shall be elected by the members of parliament from among the members of parliament and both of whom shall not be members of the same party. Now, this is a, a small matter that I want to mention before we go off. The, the, the election of, the, you see, those of us who are not members of parliament, we are disqualified from being deputy speakers of parliament. Do you know that? Do you know that? Those of us who are not members of parliament, we are disqualified under the constitution from being deputy speakers of parliament. But we can all be speaker. Members of parliament can also be speaker. However, when a member of parliament is elected speaker, he loses his seat. Thankfully, we have had that precedent. Do Ajao, the former speaker, was a member of parliament for Ave Ave. He was sitting in the chamber. He was elected speaker of parliament. And on that day, he lost his seat. A by-election was occasioned at Ave Ave for a new member of parliament. Uh, that would have been the sixth parliament. From 2013, January 2013, on the 7th of January, 6th of January 2013, Dua Jao was, was elected Speaker of the House. And so he left his seat. But for the Deputy Speaker, it is, it is left to members of Parliament. Only them can be Deputy Speaker. We cannot be. Can you fathom a situation where people are trying to urge upon the court that when the Constitution said Deputy Speakers shall be members of Parliament only, it included the fact that they lose their voting right for four years? Can, can you think about that? Because they said deputy speaker, only members of parliament can do it. Does it mean they were anticipating that these two speakers will lose their voting right for four years whenever they are presiding? And they don't decide when they want to preside. It's when the speaker is not there. Joe Osewusu is in his second term as deputy speaker, I believe. And in the one year that he has been deputy speaker under Bagbin, I think that he has presided more often than the whole four years when he was deputy speaker under Michael Quay. It's not a situation that he's brought upon himself. It's a situation of circumstance that has brought him to regularly be the speaker. And I made that point in a conversation at the weekend. Since the beginning of the Fourth Republic, no deputy speaker has presided over budget. Not one. Because budget is so important that the speaker always does it. Since the Fourth Republic, Joe Oseusu is the only deputy speaker who has had to, because of the circumstances, preside over the budget. And we are suggesting that the framers of the Constitution, when they said deputy speakers can only be members of parliament, they meant also that they should lose their voting rights. In conclusion, we wish to restate in respect of the issues agreed for determination as follows. That upon a true and proper interpretation of Article 102 or 104 of the Constitution, deputy speaker of parliament or any other member of parliament, presiding of parliament, is entitled to be counted as part of the one half of all members of parliament present. That is to say, a presiding deputy speaker is entitled to be counted for the purpose of forming a quorum under Article 1041 of the Constitution 1992. Two, that upon a true and proper interpretation of Articles 102 and 104 of the Constitution 1992, a deputy speaker or any other member of parliament presiding over parliament in the absence of the speaker can vote and take part in a decision by parliament. That is to say that a deputy speaker or person presiding other than the speaker does not lose their right to vote when they are presiding over the proceedings of parliament. 
Accordingly, Order 1093 of the Standing Orders of Parliament is struck down as unconstitutional, the same being inconsistent with and in contravention of Article 102 and 104 of the Constitution 1992, that the decision taken on 30th November 2021 by the Parliament of Ghana to approve the 2022 budget was valid as 138 members, including the person presiding, were present in Parliament when the decision was made. Signed, Justice Emmanuel Yoni Kulendi, Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice VJM Doche, Justice of the Supreme Court, N.A. Amagache, Justice of the Supreme Court, Professor Niashi Kote, Justice of the Supreme Court, H. Owusu Miss, Justice of the Supreme Court, A. Lovelace Johnson Miss, Justice of the Supreme Court, and C.J. Honenuga, Justice of the Supreme Court. Fantastic ruling, fantastic ruling. By any standard, I want to clap for the Supreme Court. This is brutal. And that's how we deal with it. That's, how, that's, why, that's why we are excited about our democracy. That's why we're not Mali, we're not Burkina Faso, we're not all of those people. This is Ghana. The constitutional framers have been, our people have been thinking for a very long time. Our leaders have been thinking for a very long time. We have great heritage of leadership. This is a constitution that was done in 1992. We are in 2022. Ghana has had this since 19, and you have Supreme Court judges who can come and deal with this matter. I don't even know whether Justice Kulendi had been called to the bar in 1992. But here he is, Kulendi JSC, giving us an erudite judgment. I leave it here.